Hi, I'm Mika Salo. You are listening to Beyond the Grid. Welcome everybody to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. It's great to have you with us in what is a very special week for Formula One, because we're going racing again. It's been 112 days since what should have been the season opening race in Melbourne, and we're finally getting underway this weekend in Austria at the Red Bull Ring, albeit behind closed doors and with stringent social distancing measures in place. It's at that I've started the show talking about the Austrian Grand Prix, because it was at this race in 1999 that the career of this week's guest, Mika Salo, ramped up another level. If you're asking why, let me remind you. Michael Schumacher had broken his leg at Silverstone two weeks earlier, and Mika was the man who got the nod from then Ferrari boss Jean Todd to replace Schumi in the Maranello team. It was the opportunity of Mika's life, yet he took it all firmly in his stride. I remember walking down the pit lane that weekend and watching him get strapped into his Ferrari F399 ahead of the first practice session. There was a huge throng of TV cameras and photographers at the front of the Ferrari pit, yet this other flying fin was as cool as you like. He even gave us a little wave as he pulled out of the garage for the first time. Mika qualified seventh and finished ninth that weekend after getting caught up in a second corner melee. But he was to trouble teammate Eddie Irvine much more seriously in Germany at the next race, where he led until forced to let Irvine into the lead in order to help his title chances against Mika Hakkinen. It was as selfless an act as you're likely to find in Formula One, and it was typical Sala. In all, Mika contested more than 100 Grand Prix over eight years starting with a chance out of nothing at Lotus at the end of 94, before stints at Sauber, Tyrrell, BAR, Arrows, and the mega team that never took off, Toyota. He was always approachable, and he understood the game as well as anyone. He knew the politics, and he knew the games that other drivers would play. And remember, Salo raced and often beat countryman Mika Hakkinen in the junior formulas. He was bloody quick. Nowadays, he's still a paddock regular in his capacity as a driver steward, and that makes his take on Formula One, both in his day and nowadays, extremely relevant and interesting. We caught up a few months back, and we've been waiting until the Austrian Grand Prix to run the interview, because it was at the Red Bull ring that he donned the red overalls for the first time. There are some great stories in here. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I want to start by talking to you about 99, the sort of pivotal season for you. Now, at the start of the year, you were actually without a drive. That's the sort of irony of it all, isn't it? And did you think it was the end of the line? No, actually, I started the season with the uh, arrows. I was told, I think it was January time, that they want to replace me. And uh, then the BR came uh, when Zonda... Ah, but that was Zonda. only race three. But between yes. yeah, first, arrows... Yeah, I missed the first three races... And at that, what were you thinking then? I was thinking it's just, uh, that's the way it's going to be this year. And uh, I have no drive for this year. And uh, it happened so quickly. So uh, I wasn't I mean, really prepared. How does a professional racing driver feel at that moment? Were you feeling very down? Was it a difficult moment? Or were you just confident you'd just have to wait 12 months and be back in the car? Yeah, I was quite confident I'd get back because uh, there was not really many drivers available that time. And uh, I was so basically that, next in queue anyway. So yeah. I thought I wasn't very happy at Arrows anyway. So in a way, it was a relief for me to get out of there. So Zonta injures himself. Ricardo Zonta in the BAR. Just talk us through how that opportunity came about and how exciting it was. Well, it came because I was friends with Jack Villeneuve and uh, also Greg Pollock that time. So uh, it was quite soon after the accident, uh, Greg called me and said, you want to drive? And I said, why not? It would be fun to be teammates with Jack. Was it? Uh, it was fun until I had to drive uh, Imola with his spare car and he has a funny way of driving. His uh, throttle is like one millimeter from zero to full and uh, he used only one paddle on the steering wheel. He used same paddle up and down shift and it was really hard for me and he's about half a meter shorter than I am. So it was really difficult race. <laughs> that was difficult. But what about just the team in general? Because this was their first season in yes. Formula One, wasn't it? What did you find when you went through the doors in break? I don't remember ever going there. <laughs> no. Seat fit or no, no seat fit? Or? No. I think I did my first seat fit uh, at the circuit. 
Yeah, I don't think I ever went there. They sort of made it difficult for themselves, didn't they? And I remember Adrian Reynard saying, we're going to win our first race. Did you mm. feel that it was, was there a sort of arrogance to them? I don't know. It's a, had they had a good engine in the car. Uh, car wasn't too bad. It was just a bit difficult to set up, but uh, it wasn't too bad. It was very unreliable, though. And was everything centered around Jacques Villeneuve? It was, yeah, but uh, I still got a better result than him out of my few races, so he must be pissed off about that. You do those three races, and then you Santos back in the car. There were rumours mid-season. You say you said a little earlier that you know you were sort of next in line. I remember in the lead up to the British Grand Prix, there was rumours of Damon Hill going to pack it in. Were you in discussion with Jordan? Or I was. What, yes. what was on the car? I was there all the time. Yes, and uh, I was actually in England that time when the British Grand Prix was on, and I was flying back to Finland uh, on Sunday during the race, and I saw Michael's accident on the TV at, at Heathrow. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, that, 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 that's that's Schumacher, Schumacher, isn't it? And he's hit those tyres at quite a rate of not. Michael's struggling to get out of the car a little bit. I wonder if he's hurt his legs. For sure, I think Michael Schumacher is not going to be taking the restart and you could be seeing the end of his world championship chances for 1999 and no one would have wanted it to end this way. Yeah, I just thought, I hope he's okay and uh, went in a plane. And I landed and uh, went home. And soon after that, uh, Todd called me and said, I want you to come to Maranello. I said, okay, when? He said, no. <laughs> I was on the next flight to Maranello. So on the Sunday, the day of the British Grand Prix, Jean Todd was on the flight? I think he called me Monday, if I remember right. I can't remember. There aren't many drivers in the world who have had that call. How did it feel? Oh, it was nice. It was, of course, I thought, yes, finally I get a good car Good car after all that, what I've been through. So finally I get a good car. So I was just happy to go there. And can you describe that first visit to Maranello in terms of... Emotion, actually. Well, I mean, you're a Finn. It was a <laughs> big secret because they didn't want to announce it for anybody. So I was hiding in John's house for a week and uh, I wasn't allowed to go out. I was just sitting in inside and <sighs> it was actually a really hard week. I went to the factory, it took me to the factory with some van with the blankets on me. And uh, so we did see it and all this kind of stuff during that week and uh, just hiding. What kind of, I mean, I've asked you what kind of BAR team you walked into. What kind of Ferrari team did you walk into because of course everything was centered around michael he was no longer there i mean i suppose being blunt did you sense that they really wanted eddie irvine to win that world championship that was actually the first conversation with jean was that uh, i'm there to help eddie to win the championship and the team to win the constructor championship so if this situation comes up i have to help i knew the situation and it was no problem for me and eddie i was fine i knew him from japan so we had fun You'd had fun in Japan, but I mean, the stakes are higher in Formula One, aren't they? Was there a sort of more of a sort of seriousness about the relationship? Yeah, no, not really. No, it's uh, Eddie knew I'm there to support him already from beginning, and uh, it's just different uh, thing from the team. Teams are demanding much, much more. Ferrari is really demanding, and when we went testing, okay, I didn't get any test before the first race. Uh, I just did a few laps at Maranello, and then uh, when we went to first real test, then I realized what. Uh, what kind of game they are on. Why? What do they do? What's it's just ev everything counts. You know, if uh, they found one corner where I was losing a few hundreds, they made me work on it really hard to find that 500s from that corner. So it, it's, it was actually fun. And how much better was that car than anything you'd driven before? It doesn't feel much better. It's just faster. It's balanced and it grips a bit more, but uh, it doesn't feel so much different than any other car. It's just a lot faster. What about Austria then? So you go there, you've done a couple of laps of Fiorano. I think you qualified seventh and then in the race got involved in that Hacken and Coulthard yes. melee at yeah, turn Yeah, I lost my two. front wing in the second yeah. corner. And but I mean, did you feel more pressure as you lined up on the grid or quali? Or? No, I don't. I don't create pressure for myself. I, I remember I, I spun once in the practice and I got stuck in the sand with it and uh, I had to come back with a tow truck and then Ross, Ross came to me and said, why didn't you drive back? Because they had a system that you can lock the differential and... Uh, he said there was enough grip in the gravel trap to drive it back. And I don't think there was, so I just didn't say anything. I, but anyway, so yeah. it was just a learning weekend for me. And, and the relationship with Ross? Ross was from the beginning really good. He was the only one who came to see me at Jean's house. So I was sitting there alone. Jean, Jean was doing unbelievable work days. He left every morning, like five, six o'clock in the morning and came back midnight, same day. He was gone all the time. He was at the office and working. So I was completely alone for a week there and Ross came in the evening sometimes just to talk to me. 
So what were you doing in the house during the Nothing. Movie? And Jean had no furniture in the house. He just had a few front <laughs> wings and parts of the cars in there as a decoration. So Why did he want you there? Why couldn't you be in Helsinki? Why couldn't you be anywhere? Yeah, I was thinking same because I was getting married same time. So uh, we were preparing for the wedding week after. So uh, I actually wanted to be in Helsinki also, and uh, Jean just told me not to go anywhere. And he'd report back each evening of what's going on in the team and the car and the... Not really. Not even No, that. just left me home alone there. <laughs> well, look, let's fast forward to your second race as a Ferrari driver, right? It's Hockenheim. You've discussed this certainly at the time at length, but, you know, you qualify fourth ahead of Irvine. And uh, I had a test before that race. That was the first time I had actually Where was had the a test? Mugello. So I had a couple of days with the car so i knew the car better and uh, so it was just much easier to go for that hockenham race so you qualify fourth you're ahead of irvine prior to the race were team orders mentioned it was mentioned before i drove the car first time so before austria race sign here and you're also agreeing to team orders it was just uh, verbally agreed so nothing was mentioned at hockenheim prior to the race so you then take the lead you've got irvine behind you and you're just waiting for the call. I knew it's coming if I see it. There was a, there was a uh, Jordan between us for a long time. Frentzen. Yeah, and I was hoping, stay there, please stay there. And, uh, <laughs> then Because then the call wouldn't come. And then when I saw red in my mirrors, I thought, oh, it's coming soon. So then it came. How is that message delivered? I think Ross, with his annoying calm sound, he says, I want you to let Eddie pass this lap. So he explains what you, it's not, there's no sort of code like Fernando is said, faster than you no, or anything no, like I that. No, he just said, let Eddie pass this lap. Very calmly. I did. We attempted not to. I don't know. Probably would have been my last race. <laughs> Do you think it would have been? If you'd I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't even think about it. And the fact that Irvine didn't win the title that year. Yeah, he lost it with a few points and uh, it was a bit disappointing. Salo is in a very difficult position. Uh, he seems to have to pace. I, I, Ir Irvine is really, I believe, pacing himself to the end of the race. It must be so frustrating for Salo. You can just look at the front of your cockpit and see the lead of a Grand Prix, and you can't have it. But we all know Eddie Irvine's been there enough time, so Salo's got to do his apprenticeship and pay his dues, and uh, hasn't he done well doing that? Oh, if you'd said to Salo at the beginning of this season, you're going to finish second in the German Grand Prix in a Ferrari, he would have told you to go away and stop fantasizing and he would have been quite right too you go on and, and you finish second in that race your best result and then you go on also you get a podium for ferrari at monza that amazing that's actually a much nicer feeling than to stand on a podium in monza with the ferrari and uh, it was it was something special yeah so how do you reflect on those six races now mm, it was good I would like to go for full season that time. I was thinking, I wish I had a winter time to prepare for the season like that, with a car like that and team like that. So it would be a totally different story. Do you think you would have beaten Irvine over a season? Oh, easily. We'll be back with Mika after this short message. An entire Formula One World Championship packed into half a year. This season is going to be like no other. So if you're looking to upgrade your race weekend experience you can now get F1 TV for a whopping 25% off with our back on track offer. With F1 TV Pro, you can watch every race live or on demand and with full control. With exclusive features such as the pit lane channel and onboard cameras, it really is the best view for fans. And with F1 TV access, you get real-time telemetry hot off the racetrack, live leaderboard, live tracker map, live analysis, and the best of team radio. Don't miss our back on track F1 TV offer. You get 12 whole months of live racing on F1 TV Pro and live trackside data with F1 TV access. Simply go to f1tv.com and use the code BACK25 for 25% off. Now, it's important that I mention that F1 can't bring F1 TV to all of you fans out there, as different countries have different media arrangements, which means that F1 TV Pro isn't available worldwide. But if you are able to access it, then that means with F1 TV Pro, you'll be able to live stream every session from FP1 to the race, wherever, whenever, and on whatever device you want. Plus, there's exclusive access to the 20 drivers' onboard cameras. And just imagine what you'll hear on the unedited team radio alone. Everything from heat-of-the-moment rants to reflection from all of your favourite drivers. Can you imagine, for example, what some of the team radio was like at Hockenheim last year? 
That crazy wet race won by Max Verstappen. It was radio gold. And with F1 TV access, the extra features you'll get will make you feel like you've got your very own pit wall. You'll get live trackside data, which will allow you to compare drivers' lap times, which will come in very handy indeed. You'll probably be more informed than half of the people on the pit wall. OK, now I'm only joking, but it really is brilliant. So get ready for the season restart with F1 TV. Simply visit f1tv.com to claim your 25% off back on track offer with the code BACK25. That's BACK, B-A-C-K, 25. This offer is only available over the first race weekend in Austria until the 6th of July. See more, know more with F1 TV. Right, let's get back to Mika. It's quite funny, I just thought to explain that we're chatting in Singapore. Your son is currently racing in Finland. Yes. In Formula 4. Yes. Chip off the old block? Is he as quick as his old man? He has a lot to learn. He, it's his first year. He's 18 now and uh, he, uh, he didn't do any karting. So he started from zero this year and uh, he's been learning a lot. He was five seconds behind the other guys uh, at the beginning of the year. Now he's only second. So he's What's his name? Max. Max. Max Salo. What kind of a racing dad are you? Well, I'm in Singapore and he's racing in Finland. So <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, know, he's with Koiran and Grand Prix and uh, they're experienced guys. So he has a good teachers there and uh, it's better I'm not there. But if you are at a track when he's driving, are you the, I stay telling away. him I stay away. Break? No, I stay away. I yeah. can give him some advice. I'm texting him all the time. And every time I ask him how was the race or how was the qualifying, his answer is okay. <laughs> It's really annoying because I really want to know what's going on. And he, he answers, okay, for me. <laughs> he sounds a real chip off the old block, actually. Yes. He's a real fin. As the son of a driver who stood on the podium in Ferrari Red, Max Salo has a fair bit to live up to. Mika's performances in 1999 helped Ferrari return to the top of the sport, winning their first Constructors' Championship since 1983. But with Michael Schumacher coming back from injury for 2000, Mika had to find a new team. After his performances for Ferrari, he had several offers and he decided to join Sauber. Sauber was the best one, so obviously they used Ferrari engines and uh, I could stay within the contact. And, and the Sauber years? I stayed only one year. I had a two-year contract and I stayed only one because uh, I didn't really get along with uh, Peter so well. And, uh, and uh, then Toyota came up in the middle of the season and uh, I decided that because I learned from Ferrari that you need to be with the big boys and uh, to get anywhere and uh, that's why I took Toyota. So you did a year of testing with Toyota. Yes. So they're both manufacturer teams. Is that where the similarity ends? Yeah, about, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did you step into there? Because they had a massive budget. Yeah, there was nothing else there. So it was, it was a bit confusing. A lot of rally mechanics, a lot of uh, engineers from Audi, sports cars, and uh, no real Formula One experience. I was basically only one from Formula One there. So it was a bit, bit of a mess that, that test year. Well, how good was that test car? It looked quite primitive can from I, the outside. Can I really say what I think about it? Yeah, go on. <laughs> it was a piece of shit. It was, it was really bad. It was yeah. heavy like hell and uh, really difficult to work with. And uh, it was, I, I don't know, maybe 100 kilos overweight. And uh, it was like a bus. Because you tested a whole bunch of different tracks, didn't you? All yeah, we did the most of the circuits. Uh, yeah. We followed the uh, F1 calendar and we stayed there always week after. But it sounds like you learned nothing because the car was so unrealistic in a way compared to what you're going to be racing yeah, the following year. Just collected data. And, uh, did they have any idea what they were going to need to do to improve performance for the following year? At that point, not really, no. It, it was uh, it was obvious from the beginning that the test car was uh, not very good. So uh, I was just waiting to get some things done. The problem was also that I hurt myself really badly at the beginning of the test. Uh, we had a big accident in uh, Paul Ricard and I broke my back from three places. So I was gone for almost three months, four months from the beginning. It was the first time we ran the car. Uh, something broke in the suspension and I hit the wall there. And I was gone for a long time. So basically nothing happened during that time. Alan McNeish was driving also, but uh, he also he didn't have any Formula 1 experience. So there was not much happening during that time. I was a bit upset when I got back four months later and uh, so nothing was done. Craig, I didn't realise you'd broken your back. Uh, it still hurts. <laughs> Even today? Yes. So we wake up in the morning and you've got that? Yeah, I have to. Yeah, stretch a lot and uh, do a lot of things for my back to get moving in the morning. And did it affect you in the car No. after that? No. 
what adrenaline got you through or, or sort no, of the morning no, no, after no. a race would you be so no it didn't hurt it's just now now you're just uh, old I'm, I'm just old yeah so now it's bothering <laughs> me a lot so you do the test year with alan mcnish the car as you say isn't much good mm. how much of a step forward did they take over that winter going into 2002 the car designer changed uh, from uh, under the god dance did the first one the donkey <laughs> and uh, and uh, gustav brunner built the second one or designed the second one and that was actually not bad so and we had a very powerful engine in it so it was much better so we were much happier with that and uh, the season looked pretty good actually at the beginning well you scored points in first the race first race in australia yeah so yeah it was it was not too bad but uh, then the development really didn't go as planned it was a bit difficult. Every time you find something, it took too long time to make it. In Formula One, you need to react in five minutes. Basically, you need to have a part in the car if you find something what would work. And uh, it didn't work that way. So it sounds an incredibly frustrating experience. It, How- it actually wasn't because I was preparing for the next year because I knew now we're racing. And now we have really. So you had a contract for 2003 I as well? Had, I had an option, yes. And uh, I was sure that I continue because uh, I was just building all for that in my mind and I was thinking all the time that, that now this car is uh, the real test car and we are in real real conditions now to test it and uh, then uh, then at the end of the year I was told that I'm not driving anymore next year so that was not nice. Why? What reasons do they give you? Uh, they, it's normal with always teams they blame drivers first if the car is shit they wanted to change drivers. But it seems to me you were more than just a driver there you were the only guy particularly in the test year yes. who had Formula 1 experience and were you sort of thinking about recruitment those yeah. aspects of the yes. one not only driving yes also i got some people in there which i wanted to work with and uh, who were good during my many years in formula one so i knew a lot of people and uh, it was nice to get those people in there and uh, start working with those and then suddenly i was dropped yeah. so it was bad timing and left a bitter taste very bitter yes it was it was not nice uh, because we were all preparing for that 2003 year yeah and the car was better actually was it It was better yeah because it was it, developed by me yeah <laughs> <laughs> see i said you were more than just yes. a driver yeah. yes um well at what period of your formula one career Mecca, were you were you happiest mm, i think it was all the time fun i i like driving and i liked competition and uh I, I'm, I have no complaints at, at all about anything it's just uh, i was a little bit in the wrong place wrong time all the time but uh I'm still happy all the time. What about those years with Tyrrell where you were always punching above your weight? You got a handful of really, really decent results. That was good, yeah. I, I like working with uh, those guys. There's still some of them here in the paddock and uh, they're, they're good fun still. We, we really had a fun. We were just enjoying what we were doing and uh, still serious, but uh, we knew we can't win anything. So, But we maximized everything we had. We did a fastest pit stops and uh, consistent lap times every race but we still keep finishing somewhere 11th or 13th in the races did you have decent cars while you were there the harvey puzzle white did have great cars every time they were nice to drive easy to set up and uh, just underpowered every time just tell me about the genius of harvey puzzle white what was he like to work with weird <laughs> what would you I, had a, I had a session with him once in his office he told me to sit down in his in the chair and do a lap of silverstone with my eyes closed and see what I do in a car. So you was I was sitting in an armchair in his office, and he said, "Do a lap in Silverstone." He wants to see what I do. I thought that's weird. <laughs> so you did it. I did it. Yeah. What do you think he learned? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm still confused about it. Yeah. <laughs> but he made good cars, didn't he? He made really good cars, mm. and uh, Mike Gascon was helping him. Mike was really good also, so it mm. was fun to work with them. Harvey then went to the Honda project didn't he was that I mean Jos Verstappen was the guy I was took. I was second there that's just uh, what I was going yes to. I was also there so you, did you drive that test car I'd never drove it no it stopped before yeah. were you in Barcelona when you heard the terrible news about Harvey or mm. were, you, were you at that test I can't remember no I wasn't I don't think so I mentioned Jos Verstappen actually how quick was Jos he was super quick for one lap but he couldn't keep it on the track for more than a few laps so then he always fell off so a, a real challenge in quali. Yes, he was he was uh, f- probably the fastest teammate I ever had. So, but yeah, if he did a five lap or well, ten lap run, let's say, I would beat him quite a lot because I could do consistent lap times. So he he would do quick lap time, few of them, and then 
spend five seconds in the grass somewhere and <laughs> destroy one front wing. And do you know what? he 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 is the blueprint? I think mm. of how to turn your son into a yes brilliant Formula One driver. Just thinking of Max Solo, yes. actually, isn't it? In terms of everything, it seems to me everything he learns in his career from all the mistakes he made, yeah. he's he's passed on to his son. Don't yes. do that. Learn. Would you agree? And so yes. as a result, Max. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. Yeah, very good. Yeah, he's done a good job with Max, and uh, Max is just unbelievable good. If you were giving me your top three on the grid now, current Formula One? That's, of course, it's Leclerc, Lewis, and Max. Would you put them in in order? No. As in they all have their different days. You know, um, Leclerc make, still makes mistakes. Uh, Max has come down a lot from his mistakes, and he's really good, but Lewis is really strong always. More from Mika in just a minute. As you may know, I'm currently in Austria in the lead up to the first race of the 2020 F1 season. And I have to say, it feels quite surreal to be out here in the idyllic Styrian mountains. And if you found yourself dreaming of faraway places lately, mentally planning your next getaway to another country, but you don't want to feel like an outsider because you don't know the language, well, Babbel can help. Babbel is designed to get you speaking a new language within weeks with daily 10 to 15 minute lessons. That's all it takes to help you feel confident speaking in your new language. There are 14 different languages to choose from, including French, Spanish, Italian, Dutch, German and Norwegian. And the lessons are created by more than 100 language experts. And what's great is that it teaches real life conversations. You learn through interactive dialogue that you might encounter out in the real world. So you can feel confident you're not going to be saying something embarrassing when the time comes for you to put your learning into practice. Babbel is available as an app or online, so no matter where or when you log on to a lesson, your progress will be synced across all devices as you learn at your own pace. Right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription with the promo code GRID. Go to babbel.co.uk and use the promo code GRID, that's G-R-I-D, on your six-month subscription. So, Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot co dot UK slash play, promo code GRID. Right, let's get back to the final part of our chat with Mika. Who was the most influential person on your career oh i can't name just one uh, it's difficult i mean on one level you could say maybe peter collins because he put you in the lotus didn't yeah he, he was the he was the beginning of my formula one yes he was the one who made me a phone call before japanese grand prix 94 and uh, called me middle of the night and woke me up and said you want to drive next weekend and i said of course did you think you're having a dream <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I, he, yeah, he was the one so yeah, he helped me to go he was the reason i got in formula one that japanese grand prix in 94 mm. the weather was appalling it was horrible yes what a place to meet yeah. the scariest track in formula one in the wet and I never drove Formula One in my life. I had never driven a Formula One car. Straight in the free practice. And uh, yeah, I was happy I qualified. And I actually passed my teammate twice during that race. So I it passed. Was a great him. race. You finished 10th. Yeah, I passed. Alex Tanadi was my teammate. And uh, I passed him before the red flag. And then I passed him again after red flag because they made me start behind him. Yeah. Restart. Yeah. I mean, it was an amazing debut. It was horrible weather. Horrible, horrible weather. Also, a really difficult time for Lotus as well. And for yeah, Peter. It was last race. Uh, it was Adelaide, the second yeah. Adelaide was the last race. Yeah, they were completely out of money. So, mm. what about Mike Greasley? He was your manager, wasn't he? Mike was great all the time, and uh, he had this uh, stroke early on uh, when I started in Formula One. So then I was a bit left out for a while, but he still could manage everything. And uh, with Sue, his wife, they did a good job every year. It was nice and relaxing work with them. I thought your loyalty to Mike after his stroke, I think, said a lot about you. Yeah, he managed a little few drivers and everybody else left, but I stayed. How important was loyalty for you? It's been always everything. So uh, it's one of the most important things in life to be loyal and uh, honest. So, okay, let's wind the clock back to 1990. You're in British Formula 3. There's another Finn called Mika Hakkinen. You were going at it hammer and tongs. It went right down to the wire. You were the only two drivers worth talking about that year. You both won a load of races. One of you went on to win two world championships for McLaren. One of you didn't. How, how yeah, does that no. make you feel? Uh, it's fine. I don't really look things like that. I got to do 
what I wanted all my life. I made racing as my profession and uh, been winning a lot of races everywhere else. So I just had a bad cars in Formula One most of the time. So it was not possible in Formula One. But uh, I won uh, GT championships and uh, I won Le Mans a couple of times and uh, mm. other things. So. Did you enjoy your time in Formula One? I mean, you, was, was it just there was always an undertone of frustration that you didn't have a better car, a better engine, a better? No, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, it was, of course, sometimes it was fr- frustrating because you entered the weekend knowing that you will not be in top six because there was always two Benettons, two Williams, and uh, two Ferraris, and or two McLarens. So it's pretty much impossible to be even top eight. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, no, sometimes yeah, but. Uh, that's the way it was. It went f- quite fast, the things, because you sort of have to push extra to be anywhere with those cars what I was driving. Almost having to overdrive? Or? Yes, most of the time, yes. But we did a brilliant races and uh, it all went unseen because uh, everybody's following the top guys. One last thought. There was a really interesting piece that you you, you came out with after, long after retirement about carbon dust and that your doctor had said, Crikey, you've got a lot of dust in your lungs. And and you were saying, this ain't any good. We need to look after ourselves here. First of all, you know, from a health point of view, has that all gone now? That, that, that yeah, it's no problem at all for me. It actually starts from really long time ago. I broke my ribs and lung in the Formula 3000 in Japan a long time ago with the accident. And it bothered me all the time. So I, I had a hole in my lung which leaked once a year. So they need to make a small hole and make it back how long did that go on for? Whole Formula One career because uh, there was no time to have operation. So as soon as I stopped in Formula One, I went to have operation and they took removed that part of the lung, which was damaged. And uh, then the doctor said, yes, they're completely black, your lungs. And uh, then they did uh, some tests and it was carbon. So there's been a lot of carbon dust in the air. And uh, I can, it's not only drivers, but you can imagine the mechanics and everybody else also, the tire changes and all this but yeah it was studied by FIA and there was nothing poisonous or anything like that there so it's fine and they just naturally clean so you you had a hole in your lung for the duration of your Formula 1 career is that what you just said yes there was a damaged part which leaked about once a year and it was so painful every time so I get uh, my one lung would collapse just suddenly what would bring that on just physical exercise or there was no reason it just came once a year. I have so many holes in my ribs here because they, then they make a, they take a knife and put the hole just here on the side. Are you I, conscious or, or? Yeah, yeah, just with the painkillers. <laughs> it was really painful, and I got tired of that because it was so painful every time they did that operation. So uh, when I started with Toyota, it happened uh, six days before the first race in Australia and we were doing promotion in Japan and uh, I had it in a hotel suddenly I could feel the pain in the chest and you knew and exactly I, what it was I knew exactly what it is because I had it so many times so we went to hospital in Japan did the hole I had a valve on my lungs and I flew to Australia we took stitches off on Thursday evening and Friday we did practice so that's extraordinary just while we're talking about Japan you spend a lot of time out there after British Formula 3 but how did you find Japan it was good racing we, we were there because you were in a one-car team. To start I was in anyway. one-car team, yeah, which was a bit unfortunate because uh, I did not, not have any experience of Formula 3000, first of all. And, uh, but I was racing against the guys like Johnny Herbert and uh, Eddie was there, Irvine, uh, Volker Weidler, Jan Lammers, uh, the guys who was been in Formula 1 already and they came back to Japan. And it was quite amazing for me. I was a young boy that time and uh, racing against these guys who I always looked up to. Learning a lot. Learning a lot, yeah. It was hard and uh, had a lot of accidents there because the car was too fast for me anyway. So The, the 3000 car? <laughs> Formula really? 3000 in Japan was really fast and we used really soft tires, one lap qualifying tires. And, uh, so like a, a lap of Suzuka, how much slower were you in the 3000 car compared to a Formula 1 car? Three seconds. That all? So a pole for the 3000 race would have got you onto the F1 grid? Oh yes, easy, yeah. And what was the camaraderie like among the European drivers over there? Did you all get up to no good? Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> We were all living in the same hotel uh, between the you races. You lived in a hotel? F- yeah, first couple of years, yes. Then I told them, if I, you want me to stay, you get me an apartment because it was hotel was not nice. And uh, But we all stayed in the same hotel. We traveled together to races. In in Tokyo, is this? Or? Yes, in the middle of Tokyo. President Hotel in Tokyo. We all stayed there. It's very famous for all the... There was half of the Formula 1 grid in Japan that time. So uh, it was. we all ended up in Formula 1. 
Even, even Michael came to do a few races there sometimes. He did, didn't he? Just yes. before Isugo, I think. Yeah. Mm. And did you get homesick? Because a lot of Europeans do. I did first year. I flew, I think, 15 times back to Finland. And uh, then second year, 10. Third year, 5. Then last year, I didn't fly at all anymore. And uh, I made myself busy there because I like driving. So, for example, one season I did uh, Formula 3, Formula 3000, and then also Group A. So I raced every weekend there. So... There was no time to come back. Just loads of experience too yeah, that just, you could then apply in other Just things. racing, yeah. I think that sums up Mika Salo. Just racing. You just wanted to race. Just yes. racing. Is yes. that fair? Yeah. And you can do it all again with Sun Max now. <laughs> Let's see. You can be the driver steward when he makes it to Formula 1, right? Oh, I think there will be a little conflict then. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you enjoy that? Um, you don't make any friends with it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, n it's it's okay now uh, drivers realize that I'm there on their side so I'm there to defend drivers actually do you feel like a school teacher not really no it's uh, it's uh, I'm helping the real Stuart who knows the rules to understand what happens in a car while you're driving how hard is it to let the drivers race it's it's not hard it's uh, fair racing is always good but of course if it's this crash on purpose or uh, real stupidity then we have to do something do you like the use of this black and white flag now mm, yeah it's good there is some downsides on it, on it also for example my feeling is that the drivers will think that they have a now one free pass for every weekend for the race and you can block somebody really big time and uh get away with it once that's with your racing driver brain that's what you'd be thinking that's i right? would thinking yes and because I know that these tires, what they use now, you need only that one time to push somebody off the line. They get dirt on their tires. You get extra five second gap, just like that, and uh, they will never attack you again. In terms of the driver steward, do you wish there'd been a driver steward in your day? Oh, definitely. I got so many times in trouble because the guys in the steward room didn't understand what's happening in the car. Mika, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, no problem. Great. See you soon. I loved Mika's insights. His description of Jean Todd's house in Maranello, of it having no furniture except for a few bits of car bodywork, was gold. As were his thoughts on BAR and Ferrari, the former setup around Jacques Villeneuve with his tiny amount of throttle travel, and the latter built around Irvine, at least while Mika was there. And his magnanimity at Hockenheim in 99, where he gave up the win, was extraordinary. As soon as Irvine passed Frentzen for second place, Mika knew the call would come and he knew he'd have to give way. That was the deal. There was no question in his mind of behaving any differently. And that sums up the quality of the man. Mika, thanks for your time. It was great to catch up and I look forward to seeing you again soon at a racetrack. Well, that's almost it for this week. But before we go, let's have a little sift through the virtual mailbag. And we've had lots of feedback about last week's show with Stefan Johansson. Many of you seem to love those 80s drivers. Thomas Harrison Lord said this, Wonderful listen, Tom. Stefan was very humble about his time in Formula One. And who knew he was such a talented artist? Absolutely right, Thomas. And for those of you who haven't checked out Stefan's art, head to his website now, stefanjohansson.art. It's fantastic. And Ranjan sent us this, The next time I think I'm having a tough week, I'll just remember Stefan Johansson's week from hell and we'll keep motoring on. <laughs> well, yes, Stefan's description of Austria 87 really was something, wasn't it? From run-ins with the local wildlife to botch pit stops and being told he'd lost his drive, you couldn't make it up. And finally, I enjoyed this message from Glamorous Triathlete, great name, who said, listening to Tom's interview with Stefan Johansson, who was commenting on not understanding why he was so popular in Japan. Curious, I googled him and I can tell you exactly why he was popular in Japan. He's hot. Well, Glamorous Triathlete, I've emailed your tweet to Stefan just to make sure he sees it. I'm sorry that I don't have time to read out all of your messages, but please keep them coming because we read them all and we love them. And if you want to drop me a message, I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter and you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Thanks for listening. Back next week, same time, same place. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.